hocam istediğiniz yere geç, ortaya geçebilirsiniz veya şuraya geçebilirsiniz. Welcome to Rethink Institute. I am uh, Fevzi Bilgin, director of the institute. Uh, today uh, we are going to discuss uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy and challenges it faces. Uh, and uh, we are joined by uh, very distinctive and prominent uh, experts on Turkish foreign policy from Washington and from Turkey. So uh, you have uh, short bios in the program. Uh, let's start with uh, Mr. Michael Verse from Center uh, on American Progress. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here at Rethink. And, uh, and you mentioned the, uh, the distinguished uh, scholars and expert. I'm sure you were referring to Isa and Dagi. It's a great <laughs> pleasure and an honor to share the panel with you. Um, what I would like to do is to speak a little bit about the, uh, the foreigners, the outsider's perspective on, on Turkish foreign policy and what has happened. Because as you might be able to imagine, it's really hard to make, to make sense out of many things. And the changes have been, have been quite dramatic. And if one takes a step back, which I think is important in times of political turmoil that we are witnessing right now, things are going on very, very quickly and uh, moving into all kinds of different directions at the same time. Excuse me, Mike. Please. Let's, let's lift your... Uh, the microphone? Yes. So is this, is this better? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, might be a conspiracy behind the microphone. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, what I would like to do is to take a step back and, and try to look at the broader picture and try to understand what has happened in Turkey. And my feeling is that when it comes um, to uh, the way the, the major players in the AKP are looking at the world and they're looking at their neighbors and including their own country, um, there are certain parameters that are being that are being applied, and I think they are they vary slightly between a group that um, I would say has more of a cultural worldview that is infused by religion, not in the sense of political Islam that many. Uh, observers try to detect the Turkish foreign po policy, but more uh, in, a, in a way to look at the world in terms of cultural distinctions. And I think that includes, and I'm speaking in very broad terms and, and, and slightly uh, superficial here, that includes the prime minister, the foreign minister, uh, includes people like Ibrahim Kalin. Um, and on the other hand, you have a segment in the AKP, probably most prominently represented by, by the president, um, who are looking at the world in more strongly universalist terms. And the question is, um, where does this come from and how de did these worldviews uh, shape uh, up over the last few years? And I think two or three observations are important to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, recognize here. Uh, first of all, um, there is, um, and I'm saying this with all respect, there's, there's little tradition of uh, multi uh, lateral foreign policy in Turkey because Turkey is a country that was not only frozen into the Cold War like probably no other country in the world because the entire North, the entire East and most of the South was basically closed up until 1989. And on top of that, the Turkish domestic situation was characterized by a tremendous arrested development, especially in Central and Eastern Anatolia, where until the late 1980s, early 1990s with the economic opening of, of uh, President Özal and basically a political decision not to export uh, poor people to Germany and France and Denmark uh, anymore, but provide op pro political and economic opportunity within the country. These were converging trends that really pushed Turkey into an entirely new environment in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I think the domestic changes um, are resulting in 2002 in great part to the electoral victory of the AKP. I would even go so far as to think about as to whether it is correct to say the AKP is much more a result of tremendous domestic transformations in Turkey, of new people in the country, in the central and eastern part that didn't have a political voice over a prolonged period of time, looking for that political possibility, than the AKP being actually the motor and the engine of that, of that process. And in parallel, um, you have a situation where Turkey all of a sudden <clears throat> has to answer a lot of questions with regard to its neighbors because the neighborhood is open. The Eastern Levant, the Levant is becoming a geopolitical entity once again, which it hadn't been during the Cold War. 
And the questions are really complex because if Greece is your most reasonable and most stable neighbor, you know that you're living in a complex environment. Uh, at the same time, uh, contrary to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to, to many uh, perceptions, there is no great prolonged experience of regional policy in Turkey. There is, compared to Washington at least, again, with all respect, there are, uh, at least in the, in the 1990s and early 2000s, relatively few think tanks, relatively few foreign service officers that have extended competencies and, and uh, experiences in those countries. USAC did this fantastic study where they looked at the uh, 136 uh, Turkish uh, policy offices in the Turkish consulates and embassies in the Arab world. And six of them speak Arabic. And this shows that there is, um, to a certain degree, um, a lack of, of capability and capacity to cover uh, the, the territory. And this is one of the reasons why Foreign Minister Dabutolo is so adamant about pushing the Foreign Service forward into those uh, new discussions. So I think that these two parallel development, tremendous domestic uh, transformation, and if you look at the numbers um, that uh, Turkey in, in the 1970s was only 30% urbanized, and it is almost 60% uh, urbanized only a generation later. So you have a tremendous domestic change where everything is turned upside down. And at the same time, you have amazing questions coming up of how do we interpret the reality around us that is new, and it is not to say that any other country in the world, including Europe or the United States, has a better clue of what is going on in the region. But Turkey is exposed because it is neighboring all of those countries. And so my impression is that there were, from the beginning, uh, in the early 2000s, there was the universalist utopian perspective in the AKP. And again, I'm, I'm exaggerating those categories, um, where um, Prime Minister Erdogan declared in 2009, we are not the country surrounded by enemies anymore trying to overcome that, 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 that Turkish uh, notion that everybody is trying to hold the country down. Davodolo, of course, zero problems uh, with our neighbors, turning old enemies into friends, um, uh, basically pushing back, back against phobias with regard to Western imperialism. Uh, they were brushed aside in the early days of, of the AKP. And I think this was more the universalist conservative perspective where there was a real notion of there is a political possibility and the context was defined in political terms. But there always was an undercurrent to also define the region <clears throat> and the broader environment in religious or cultural terms. And I think it is important here to note that, um, again, contrary to uh, common uh, sense and common sense arguments, religious worldview in a secular age, by and large, are the product of modernization and are often the product of the need for meaning and orientation. They're not something ancient that you reconnect to. They are quintessentially modern worldviews. And especially if you, if you look at the way um, the, your, over the past few years about uh, of how some leading figures in the AKP have conceptualized the world with that notion of um, a global Muslim community, um, that was culturally defined. The amb ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis Israel, uh, which I think is probably less anti-Semitic as some uh, people that don't like Turkey very much would claim here in town, but more culturally defined as, as an entity that does not entirely belong in that region. But that culturalizing worldview is also simplifying um, the, the notion of what is happening politically in the countries. And I think this is part of the explanation Correct me if I'm, if I'm totally off the mark here. Partly the explanation for those wild mood swings that, as of a few years ago, <clears throat> Bashar al-Assad is a friend and you almost enter into a family vacation. And then it goes, it turns around and it is, it is just uh, the arch enemy uh, that you cannot speak uh, to anymore. Um, the notion that Turkey has the legitimacy and the right, for example, in 2012, to mingle in the 1971 uh, war crimes tribunals in Bangladesh, where Turkey really interfered fairly massively in the internal and domestic affairs of a foreign country with the notion that because there were representatives of a Muslim party uh, uh, on trial, that the Turkish ambassador had something or needed something to say about this. And so I think these are just uh, pieces of, of, of the puzzle that I try to put together because my feeling is that from the rather universalist notion of seeing political opportunity and, 
and formulating a differentiated uh, a, a view of, of the neighborhood and of foreign policy um, because of the domestic confrontation, uh, the deeply uh, polarized situation uh, in the country, the fact that the prime minister seems to follow a political strategy that is set up to deepen those divisions. That also translates into a, I wouldn't call it bipolar, but a very, very uh, structured view of good and bad and we and the others in the immediate region. <clears throat> I think the interesting part here, if I look back at the US context, the first thing that comes to mind, if I try to figure out where was an example in recent US history where foreign policy was structured in a, in a similar way, I would say neoconservatives. <laughs> so um, sometimes when I hear the current government speaking about Egypt, speaking about Israel, speaking about Syria, I think I hear a Muslim version, a Turkish version of, of American neoconservatism, which is all about regime change, the, the, the fact that it is unacceptable to have government set up the way they are, and deeply engage in domestic affairs of other countries. I'm not making a moral judgment here. Uh, I'm sympathetic to, to, the, to the arguments that uh, you need to really think hard as to whether um, what happened in Turkey, uh, in, in Egypt, is, is acceptable by any means with the ouster of a, of a democratically elected government, independently how, how many mistakes they committed when they were, when they were in government. Um, it is absolutely clear that, personally, I, I'm very sympathetic to the notion that uh, Bashar al-Assad has to go, and that the slaughterhouse that he has created in Syria is absolutely unacceptable any political humanitarian universal standards. However, the question is, to which degree does that translate into, into foreign policy leverage? And again, taking a step back, I must say, if I look at the scoreboard, so to say, of uh, the top four or five problems in the region, Northern Africa and the Levant, and maybe beyond that, and I ask myself, compared to 2002, 3, 4, 5, what is Turkish leverage now? When would the White House pick up the phone and say, we need Turkey to help solve this problem? Israel, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Probably not. So my argument here would be if in the moment your culturally infused worldview starts undermining the vital national interests of your own country, then it's time to rethink policy and to come up with a differentiated uh, notion of what is happening in the region. And I think that is something that would also bring the Turkish government once again closer uh, to the United States. I think there is a fairly thorough reassessment uh, going on in Washington at this time, because it is uh, complicating uh, issues for the White House that only a few days after the prime minister and his family got uh, one of the highest level visits of any uh, foreign leader uh, here in this town with uh, extensive uh, face time with the president, the vice president, vice president actually twice, and the secretary of state, a lot of public meeting, great uh, photo ops. And then only a few days later, we enter the uh, the the confrontation that starts with a few trees and easy park and then of course morphs into a, a much more basic uh, issue. Let me just um, end on, on, on that notion. I think that there is a parallelism between the way that um, the, the Gezi Park protests were, uh, from my perspective, uh, um, analyzed and, and mismanaged from a government perspective uh, along the lines of a we against them logic um, uh, to the way the external affairs of, of Turkey are being framed uh, in this phase of the AKP government. And my question, and that is a question that we try to answer in Washington and that you and uh, our friends from Ankara and Istanbul are much more qualified to answer is, um, will this be a position, will this be a logic that will persist and go on uh, over the next year or two years? Um, and um, is there a, a realistic expectation that um, the current government, which is strong and has a massive majority in the parliament, will be able to overcome um, a certain disregard for the public sphere domestically and a very confrontational stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its uh, neighborhood and many uh, neighboring and regional uh, powers uh, more broadly? Um, because I think ultimately this is what is going to decide not only the outcome of current political affairs in 2014 and 2015, it will also define the legacy of the prime minister. 
uh, who has uh, um, great merits for pushing the military out of the political picture in, in Turkey. And I think that is going to stay uh, as, a, as a legacy that, uh, that, uh, that at least people that come from a humanitarian and emancipatory perspective will always uh, hold in high regard. At the same time, um, the question is, um, will a differentiation of the foreign policy perspective uh, go hand in hand with a greater uh, uh, diversity and respect for pluralism domestically in Turkey? And again, that's a question that, uh, that we are very interested in discussing because Turkey is one of the key allies of the United States in the region, um, and it will continue to be uh, a, a prime target of uh, U.S. interest and, and, and U.S. cooperation because uh, of where Turkey is and, and its uh, strong economic and political role in years to come, independently of the current hiccups. And the question here, uh, once again, is <clears throat> how can we redefine uh, those and reframe those conversations um, to get them into more productive context? So thank you very much. And so I hope this helps us set up the discussion. Right. <clears throat> thank you, Michael. Uh, if you'd like to tweet about this event, okay, we have this beautiful hashtag, we think Turkish FP, please use it. And we have a Twitter account which we try to promote. It's new, so uh, use it as much as you can. We'll retweet your tweets and we'll follow you. Get some water, maybe. Yeah. All right. Uh, I uh, I would like to talk about uh, a little bit. I want to take you back in in time to uh, uh, 12 years ago, 2001, 2002, when uh, uh, the current minister Davutoglu published his book. Uh, strategic depth. So um, it was it was an interesting time, uh, I think, uh, especially the period between 99 and 2001 was probably the one of the darkest period in, in recent history of Turkey in terms of political crisis. Okay. Good spread of cooperation. Yes. Okay. Uh, the the period between 99 and 2001 uh, is uh, was was one of the darkest, uh, you know, moments in Turkish history, with uh, plagued with political crisis and financial crisis and so on. So uh, it's interesting that uh, when I visited him as, as a graduate student, he was a professor in a small private university, and and he said that he wrote this book, uh, which was really. Uh, interesting, sophisticated, brilliant, in my opinion, unprecedented vision uh, for, uh, you know, going all, all into all sorts of details about Turkey's strategic depth and so on. So, uh, so far, uh, the book has been, uh, has sold like 80,000 copies, which is a big deal for, for Turkey as an academic book. It's not an easy read. It's, it's really, actually, it's difficult. And, uh, and uh, but it's not translated to English. I don't know why. Public publishing house policy, but so far, it kind of uh, provided as as a guidebook for 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 Turkey's uh, uh, foreign policy in later years. So I think there is no question that he was the architect of Turkish foreign policy, first as an advisor, be starting 2002 all the way to 2009, and after that, serving as foreign minister, uh, minister of foreign affairs in the last four years. So. Um, uh, I think the, the the biggest paradigmatic shift, the big idea of the last 10 years, the AKP rule and everything else, was the emergence of these, uh, these notion uh, as, as Turkey as an idea, as a project, as a vision, which uh, uh, I can describe as, as a Turkey as a Muslim country, a democracy uh, with strong economic growth, uh, a government in peace with its own people, Powerful but peaceful, cooperative, inspiring country for the region. I think that was that was the idea. That's the project. That's the idea, and uh, to great extent, uh, you know, the, the reformulation of Turkish foreign policy by Davutoglu uh, contributed to that idea, uh, maybe until until very recently. So. Um, it is. The, the, the book or, or the argument itself was criticized as being neo-Ottoman or Islamist 
or, or whatever. But I think it's it's neither neo Ottoman, it's not country, uh, uh, promoting any neo Ottomanism or Islamism. I think uh, he's even like uh, arguing against those, and uh, it's 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 a proactive policy that he's he's uh, uh, wishing uh, in and. and it's, it's kind of not, not pro-Western, not, not pro-Eastern, but in all directions that Turkey is opening up itself and then getting out of its shackles that have been holding it up. And, uh, and based on his assumptions, uh, he claimed in the book that uh, Turkey's uh, international legal boundaries are much narrower than its geopolitical, geocultural boundaries, so that the tension that Turkey is facing most of the time in international politics is because of the disparity between its legal borders and geopolitical borders. So this is a kind of very assertive claim, uh, not necessarily <coughs> aggressive or expensive or neo-Ottoman, no imperialist, but it, it more of uh, uh, you know uh, giving basically informing people about the possibilities and potential potentials of, of Turkey's uh, that. So he was also very critical, you know, in detail about the conventional Turkish foreign policy outlook, which he claims was passive, parochial, bound by agendas set by other people, other powers, lacking political will and foresight. So so it's, it's interesting that these ideas were coming in one of the darkest period uh, from a person who has no, basically, uh, official position in the government. We didn't even know about whether AKP would come to power or so at this time. So, so in that respect, I think it was a great contribution in terms of uh, uh, you know, seeding these ideas, especially for the next generation. So uh, I found it very interesting at the time, and I read it again before this conference just to refresh my mind. He has this interesting formula for international power uh, that he developed in himself. He says that you know, there are uh, fixed assets like history, geography, population, culture, which you cannot change. Right? And then there are potential assets where uh, economic capabilities, technological capabilities, military capabilities. You can modify that. You can improve this or disprove it. And, uh, but these assets appreciate only and only if multiplied by strategic conception and planning and political will. And there comes the originality in the sense that, you know, uh, it's conventional to talk about Turkey's uh, geopolitical location being a bridge and having all these, you know, having access to all the basins sea basins and land basins and so on and so forth. But he claimed that as long as you don't have the strategic conception which is informed by history and planning which is informed by you know, contemporary realities, enlightened, well-educated, diplomatic and political cadres, you can't really appreciate, you can't really use these, uh, use these assets. And I think there he is was referring probably his own, you know, when, when he got the opportunity, basically, uh, his, his own uh, practice. But at the same time, uh, at the t when, when we were thinking at the time, I mean, when there was no light at the end of the tunnel, it, it was some sort of a, a academic, you know, a gesture to the, to the uh, political officials to implement some, something like that. So, So, and, and there were other things. For example, uh, Turkish strategy at the time, I mean, th these were all very unconventional. That's why I think it's important to emphasize that what, where Turkey was and, and uh, what we are now, uh, you know, talk, when we are talking about the Turkey's challenges at the moment, we are talking about Egypt, we are talking about Syria, we are talking about all sorts of things, or like, you know, the issues in Somalia and so on and so forth. But, but at, the, at the time, I think the number one and only issue sometime was, was, was Greece or, or Cyprus. And that's what the parochialism that he was referring to. And, uh, and he was talking about like near land basins of Balkans, Middle East, Caucasus, and sea basins of Black Sea, Adriatic, East Mediterranean, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, and Caspian, and uh, continental basins and so on. So that was a very expensive outlook, which was not really uh, uh, conventional at the time um, for Turkey. So, 
so he even claimed that you know if you if you want to hold Turkey together, uh, you know, sustain the territorial integrity, integrity and everything else, you have to basically be active in Balkans, in Middle East and Caspian uh, to do that. Within the international borders, you won't, be allowed, you won't be able to do that. So these were very radical for the, for the time being. So when we, when we look at these uh, arguments, we have seen a lot of developments, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, promoting Turkish foreign policy uh, in terms of these uh, principles. For example, uh, when he was an advisor, he was very active, uh, especially in Africa, going, uh, basically taking a plane, going all over the countries and so on, and uh, checking uh, areas for agricultural development and things like that. And after that, at some point of time, I think in 2001, Turkey opened like 34 embassies altogether simultaneously in Africa. So this was, this was part of this vision. And, uh, and, and I think when, when, if, when we have been talking about Turkish foreign policy, let's say two years ago, three years ago, these were very interesting developments. And, and, and maybe if we had this event at the time, we would celebrate Turkish foreign policy rather than discussing the challenges that it faces. So, so I think it is telling, uh, it is telling that you know these sort of things have happened, and uh, but then after that, uh, things start to go wrong, and it's important to see what are the culprits and what can Turkey do after this time. Um, I think this idea of <clears throat> Turkey as being you know Muslim democratic, economically politically powerful country, I think that idea was well alive until 2010, 2009, 2010. So. Uh, since then, I believe that it is uh, seriously challenged, and uh, I thought about it. What would be the culprits? I, I, th I, I can I can think of three things. Uh, first is, I think the centralization of power in in prime minister and and domestication of foreign politics, foreign policy, especially as we observed during the Egyptian crisis, crisis of Egypt, where you know some foreign policy issues become like domestic politics issues, and and it is. Uh, processed and debated uh, in, in like manner. So that, that is one thing that usurped the foreign policy uh, vision and advancements that have been uh, realized in the last 10 years or so. Uh, other things, co conflicts like Syria, I think it proved to be too complex for Turkey, the experience of Turkey or, or the manpower of Turkey, expertise in Turkey. I think it, it just proved to be too complex <coughs> too difficult to deal with. And another thing, uh, the Arab Spring, the unpredictable dawn and dramatic retreat of Arab Spring seemingly disrupted Turkey's plans. It appeared to be helping in the beginning, but I think it disrupted altogether. Uh, but despite all these things, okay, uh, was the vision that came up in in between 2000 to 2010 or so. Was, was it wrong? I don't think so. I don't think it was wrong. Uh, I mean, for example, zero problem with neighbors. Uh, actually, the original formulation of the principle was, you know, peaceful cooperation with neighbors and utmost cooperate, actual utmost cooperation with neighbors. And uh, so uh, was, was this a wrong policy? I don't think so. I, th I think it was, it was a good policy, and everybody was excited at the time. Everybody was proud of it. Everybody was happy. I think uh, people were celebrating that this is a great idea. And was it, for example, wrong to reconcile with Armenians? I don't think so. It didn't work, but, but it was a good try. Uh, how about mediating between Syrians and Israelis? I think, I think that, that, was, that was good. That was good policy. Uh, was it wrong to mediate between the West and Iran? And I th no, it it was not. It was a good policy. It probably delayed some some sort of a, like a war on war, Iran or so, maybe a few years. So uh, I think these were noble efforts, but they failed. So and uh, and they failed probably for above reasons and some of the other reasons that I will I will mention. Uh, do I think that Turkey punched above its weight? Occasionally, yes, maybe. Yes, I, I think I think we can say that. But I think the most important thing in in the book, Davutoglu mentions that the 
biggest, most important strategic asset of a country is human factor, the people. You know, the political and diplomatic cadres who are enlightened, educated, polyglot, speaking a lot of languages, knowing the you know, history, geography, culture of the countries that they are working with, proactive, you know, peaceful, advancing this thing. Did we, I mean, did we have, uh, are, are these people present in the in circles in Turkey? Far from it. I mean, they're, they're not. I, I think there is a growing generation that would probably uh, live up to these expectations in a, genera in, a, in a 20 years or so, but not at the moment. I think you, you just mentioned about the, the survey, yes, about the Arabic speakers. So uh, least known languages in Turkey are Arabic, Russian, Persian. These are the neighbors of Turkey, and they are the neighbor languages. Everybody is supposed to speak English or so. And, and even the Middle Eastern uh, experts working on the Middle East and so on, they learn from the English uh, language publications. So, uh, and I think it's no different in the, in the diplomatic cadres. If we have among us some, you know, I'm sure that we have brilliant Turkish diplomats among us probably, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, the old generation, especially the, the previous generation of diplomatic cadres have really uh, very incapable in basically promoting, advancing this vision. So this is one of the things that at the moment in Turkey can invest more than anything else. Because, you know, the, the, the culprits that I mentioned, uh, for example, the, the consolidation of power in, in prime minister or, you know, the two complex uh, problems, Arab Spring, I think those things will not change overnight. We have to wait, all right? So next year is very critical for Turkey. <clears throat> there will be elections and so on, and there will be some changes, I'm sure of it. But then, if, we, if Turkey wants to invest in future, it needs to invest in people, the human factor, so that they can probably, they can, you know, in the future, hopefully, will realize this vision. So, and, and, and I believe that despite all these challenges, uh, if you move beyond the Syrian quagmire, the, the scandalous politics probably in Egypt or so, the idea of Turkey is still well received in many parts of the world, I, I, I believe. And it will continue to do so. That's how I feel. That's how I feel when I travel, when I talk to people, okay? And many, many people from many, many nations visit our office, and that's what they say. And I think this is a greatest asset that needs uh, not to be squandered and well, uh, uh, and should be invested even more. So, uh, and I would like to stop here and give the word to Professor Dao. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Faisal Bey. Uh, I'm grateful that you invited me to this meeting. Uh, I think it's going to be a good platform to rethink Turkish frame policy in the Rethink Institute. Uh, it seems that uh, Turkish frame policy really need some rethinking. Uh, we, I think, so far had a general view of Turkish frame policy and how Turkish frame policy evolved, especially in the last 10 years. Uh, so basically, we are talking about frame policy of the ruling up party. But in the past, the conception of Turkish foreign policy uh, was somehow different. You used to think that foreign policy belonged to the foreign policy was a realm belonged to the state. So we used to talk of talk of foreign policy as of the state policy, independent of political parties, independent of political preferences. That used to be really the way. Uh, so political parties uh, coming to power. Uh, did not really have major differing ideas about main orientation of Turkish foreign policy uh, or uh, the implementation of those major policies in specific areas. Foreign policy was supposed to follow the tradition, the line set up by the state, bureaucracy, the military. Uh, so political actors we're not really in a position to redefine Turkish foreign policy. Uh, but of course, they, they, they responded to the uh, circumstances, especially after the end of the Cold War. Uh, political actors, governments uh, uh, responsible, uh, came up with initiatives to 
uh, have an impact on the formulation and implementation of Turkish frame policy. But that became ever more evident under the AK Party rule. So we can, I think, I think safe talk of Turkish foreign policy as a line uh, formulated and implemented solely by the AK Party, the government responsible and in charge of Turkish foreign policy. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that in fact started with uh, mid and late 1980s, you know, the influence of political actors to formulating foreign Turkish foreign policy uh, rose under the leadership of Turgut Özal in mid and late 1980s. There, uh, economics came into the picture of making Turkish foreign policy. Until uh, that time, Turkey was too much state-centric, even in, in its uh, pursuit of foreign policy. Uh, foreign policy was regarded as an area uh, to be shaped by Turkey's security concern only. Very large, to very large extent, when Turkey Özal started to add an economic dimension to Turkey frame policy, it was criticized for kind of watering down the seriousness of uh, Turkey frame policy. So, with Özal, new dimensions like uh, trade, expansion of Turkey's uh, foreign trade, economic actors in, uh, inviting uh, foreign companies into Turkey to invest. And those issues uh, came into the picture of making uh, <coughs> making Turkish foreign policy. But in 1990s, especially in mid and late 1990s, that uh, rise of politics in influencing foreign policy formulation came to an halt, uh, especially when the welfare party under the leadership of Nejmet Nerbakan won election in 1995 and became prime minister. When he was prime minister, for, inst for instance, in 1997, uh, he decided to go visit Iran. That was his first foreign trip, and that was a huge debate in Turkey. Then his uh, state visit to Libya uh, again became a big controversy in Turkey. Because, I mean, the public and institutions within the country were not really accustomed to the idea that the government can pursue an independent foreign policy uh, independent from the preferences uh, and to, to some extent dictation of bureaucracy, military bureaucracy, and uh, foreign policy uh, uh, bureaucracy uh, as well. So that was really the background uh, to the AK Party when it came to power in, 2000, uh, in 2002. Uh, it was extremely difficult for the AK Party to, to formulate and pursue its own foreign policy. So it stick to uh, major objectives and orientations of Turkish foreign policy, like membership in NATO, being part of the Western Alliance, and seeking membership in the European Union. These were the ma major parameters of uh, Turkish foreign policy at the onset of the uh, AK Party rule. Uh, <clears throat> when AK Party came to power, uh, the party was really weak vis-a-vis -vis the state institutions, military, bureaucracy, judiciary, universities, even some segments of civil society, media, etc. Uh, the party was regarded as a kind of anomaly in Turkish politics not really representing uh, a genuine uh, uh, forces in Turkey, but something uh, like, like an anomaly. So the party felt, I think, at the beginning, tremendous insecurity vis-a-vis -vis -vis those state institutions and the prevailing mood in the society. So out of this insecurity, uh, the art party had to really perform well. Perform especially in two realms, economic development and democratization. Economic development was essential for the AK Party to sustain the support of the people that they, 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 they managed to generate in 2002 elections. So economic development was really essential to sustain popular support. Second was democratization. Democratization was important for the AK Party in 2002 
because it was a matter of survival for the AK Party. All those state institutions, military, judiciary, uh, high bureaucracy, treated AK Party as an, as, as an anomaly and they exercise, exercise extra political power on political process and actors. So AK Party was really surrounded by institutions at home uh, that, uh, that, that uh, regarded AK Party as not a normal political party. Uh, so in such a domestic context, our party needed an environment conducive to economic development in order to sustain its popular support, and it needed an environment conducive to democratization. And there, uh, we had the foreign policy that I think we all appraised, uh, the idea of cooperation instead of in, instead of conflict uh, seeking uh, alliances uh, <clears throat> mediation engagement uh, non-zero-sum perspective in Turkish foreign policy they all came out of this search for the art party search for security they, they, the, the priority for the party uh, at, uh, at that time was to expand its political realm in Turkish uh, in Turkish politics, so for that, uh, <clears throat> for that foreign policy was in fact an instrument to empower AK Party vis-à-vis -vis the military, vis-à-vis -vis the judiciary, and high bureaucracy uh, in Turkey. So they abandoned the old paradigm in, of Turkish foreign policy uh, based on security, centrism, uh, animosity, or uh, distrust towards, towards the neighborhood. <clears throat> so uh, we moved from uh, a foreign policy, uh, from, from conflict to cooperation, from security centrism to economics, from hard power to soft power. So these were really the features of uh, our party foreign policy uh, right uh, at the beginning. As a result, in its foreign policy, uh, our party minimize, tried to minimize political problems. Uh, for political problems with neighboring countries like Greece, uh, attempt to resolve the Cyprus question, uh, tried, started an initiative to reconcile with Armenia, etc. Try to minimize, minimize political problems. And also try to maximize political dialogue with every actor uh, in, in, in the neighborhood and in the globe uh, as, a, as a whole. We see a policy of prioritizing cooperation over conflict and tension. It, they try to really expand Turkish trade in the world and especially in the, in the neighborhood, and they did. They, they, they achieved a significant uh, increase in the trade value Turkey did in the, in the neighborhood. Moreover, <coughs> Turkey uh, in these early years under the party <coughs> opened up uh, uh, Turkish uh, open up Turkey's social interaction with the neighborhood Turks started to started to start to do business in the Middle East start to travel in the neighborhood uh, in the Middle East in the North Russia etc so socially the people in Turkey uh, got involved and engaged in the neighborhood as a result of this, uh, this <clears throat> opening uh, policy. You know, this notion of zero problem policy with neighborhood, uh, conflict orient, uh, I'm sorry, co cooperation or uh, based foreign policy, abandoning this siege mentality that really shaped Turkish mind uh, prior, prior to 1999 maybe. Uh, so these were really significant changes. Uh, and I then I term this uh, change as a paradigm shift in fact uh, because I, I, I what I observed then was the art party uh, was uh, abandoning this old security centric uh, perspective uh, that uh, viewed the environment as surrounded by enemies 
but moved to a new perspective that saw in its, uh, in its neighborhood not uh, adversaries, but allies and friends and partners. That was, that was a significant shift. And that shift important because this old siege mentality, this conflict-centered foreign policy in the past securitized Turkish politics, securitized Turkish politics and, uh, and served as a ground to justify authoritarian politics. So as Turkey engaged in the neighborhood, pursued a policy of zero problem, uh, and try to resolve those old issues like Cyprus, Armenia. All these desecuritized Turkish politics, uh, enabling the party, the government, and the people to deepen democracy and democratization. And in that way, of course, uh, releasing or relieving AK Party from the pressures of the military and judiciary and high bureaucracy, right? So that was really something new and revolutionary. In the, in the Turkish context, foreign policy was released from the domination of uh, a conflict-ridden perspective of, or of a perspective uh, based on security centrism. Uh, so that was somehow abandoned. So in that context, the main instrument that, that uh, appeared being used by the ruling party was so power. Turkey claimed to uh, set an example in the neighborhood with its democracy, market economy, uh, Islamic identity, uh, having no problem with democratic experimentation. They were all fine. And trade, economic development, companies, think tanks were all around the, the neighborhood. So uh, in those early years, our part presented itself as a soft power in the region intent to set an example to be emulated if they if the neighborhood some countries in the neighborhood wish but after 2010 2011 what i see is that they they shifted from soft power policy to attempts to coerce change in the middle east uh, so that was perceived in some quarters in the region as Turkey attempting to dominate the region or induce change in the region, uh, which I will come uh, later. In this, early, in, this, uh, in this early period of our party, as I said, the instrument used, uh, employed to a very large extent was soft power. In this soft power, uh, uh, elements of Turkish foreign policy we, we did not only see the states, the, the state really, and bureaucrats and diplomats. We increasingly saw civilian actors engaging in uh, in activities in the in, in the neighborhood. So civil society, companies, business communities moved in, and to very large extent, uh, led Turkish foreign policy or foreign policy diplomats as well. I mean Turkish. Business moved in, in, into Africa, tried to uh, establish economic relationship with business, and then Turkish foreign policy followed, followed the, uh, the civilian initiative, the, the traders. So uh, that was uh, the, the early AK Party foreign policy was uh, informed by these soft power elements and civilian actors uh, engaging in the process. Then we arrived 2010-2011. I think this period, this this period is important because then our party's foreign policy paradigm changed again, and to, to, to my view, reversed. Uh, what happened in 2001? 2001. In 2001, the our party was at the zenith of its power in domestic politics. A year. Uh, earlier in 2010, a constitutional amendment was passed and it eliminated serious judicial and bureaucratic obstacles for the AK Party. AK Party uh, leadership understood after 2010 constitutional amendment that they now have 
total control over the state, which is not something bad. I have always advocated that the government, civilian government, politicians should have ultimate and absolute power over the state institutions. There is, there is nothing wrong with this, but that created a particular perception among the AK Party leadership uh, people that they can, I mean, that, that builds their confidence that they can do whatever they want. That is important. Second, 2011, uh, the Arab Spring. Arab Spring, the Spring was a challenge, turned to be a challenge for the AK Party, but in early in early period, the revolutionary changes from Tunisia to Egypt and, and Syria appeared as an opportunity for the AK Party, as, uh, as, as an instrument by which AK Party could uh, could induce change in the uh, in the Middle East. So 2011, the Arab revolutions uh, built on the confidence of the AK Party. So from then on, I think the AK Party people start to think that instead of using soft power to influence regional development, they could resort to uh, hard power elements, try to acquire uh, the things in the neighborhood. Before I, 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 I end, uh, I just follow up. Uh, but you know, this Arab Spring uh, story didn't really go well. The Turkey and the Spring got stuck in Syria. Uh, and it turned out that the AK Party shifting from soft power to hard power did not really have means to uh, to, to, to materialize change in the Middle East by using uh, hard power elements. So they realize their limits. And this uh, realization of the limits of the ARC Party made the ARC Party even further, uh, I mean, nervous and more aggressive in its, in, in its pursuit of change in the Middle East according to their, their, their political preferences. And then came the uh, counter revolution or the coup in Egypt. Also, this also underlined our party's limits in in its Middle East politics, and and show that they 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 were they are not really able to induce change in the Middle East. They they have certain limits and they cannot really go forward uh, in these hard power uh, elements in the pursuit of their foreign policy. Then. The reaction of the AK Party was not to rethink its foreign policy in the Middle East, but turn inward and exploit these foreign policy issues in order to maximize its political support at home. That was, I think, the strategy which is, which is being implemented at the moment. Uh, and it will be, I think, continue. It will continue that way because in next two years, we will have three elections. Uh, as we approach to those three very critical elections in Turkey, I don't see that Turkish domestic politics will cool down. Instead, uh, the AK Party, uh, and also, I don't expect that uh, Turkish foreign policy in the, in the region will be revised uh, after seeing the limits. Instead, these foreign policy issues uh, are increasingly used in domestic conception, which, is, which takes us to the place we started, which is securitization of Turkish domestic politics via foreign policy issues. That's what we see in Turkey at the moment, and that really concerns me a lot because that risks the gains of democratization. The gains of democratization came through Turkey making peace and searching peace and cooperation in the neighborhood. Once Turkey feels threatened, insecure, therefore reactive, it goes inward and justifies authoritarian policies within the country. Just other day, I think Turk, uh, Turkish, Prime, Turkish Prime Minister was saying that on Gezi, commenting on Gezi event, he said, 
they tried to make a coup in Turkey, they couldn't, and then they moved to do it in Egypt. So when the mind works that way, so we are all alert that something might be hap might might happen, uh, and international actors, institutions are all conspiring against us. You know, these old siege mentality are coming up in Turkey. I think seriously risking Turkish democratic gains that Turkey really achieved under the leadership of Tayyip Erdogan, the current prime minister. Thank you. All right. Uh, Can I call it? Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Um, I, I just, um, just wanted that cooperation is working out really well between the two. Um, I just wanted to, um, to, to challenge your, your description of, of, the, of the zero problem policy. I appreciate what you were saying and the intentions uh, might have been good. And I, I'm very open to, with regard to your argument that foreign policy actually produced leverage with regard to the domestic situation in Turkey in the early years of the AK party. But ultimately, foreign policy is when you do the numbers. And after 10 years, putting it bluntly, the Turkey has two friends left, the United States and the Kurds. And that is very little in a complicated neighborhood. And that is the direct result. And I think um, the, the policy from the beginning on was more ambivalent than, than both of you have described it. Um, there was always a tendency, and I'm exaggerating a little bit for the sake of the discussion because I think that goes to the core of what we're debating here. A vigorous criticism of Israel, an entire reluctance to talk about Sudan or uh, Syria when there was still the love affair with, with Assad. Um, a, a, a clear, and you described it, um, reference to the uh, Ottoman colonial traditions, at the same time, strong anti-colonial rhetoric, for example, when it came to Palestine. And an amazing desire to deepen Turkish influence and increase Turkish weight in NATO. At the same time, a, a, an easygoing uh, attitude of becoming a spokesperson for anti-Western uh, attitudes. And it seemed to me that from early on, um, there was a big desire to be recognized by the autocrats and the population in the region at the same time. And you can't have it both ways. And if you say Syria is complex, I would say it is complex now. But Syria was not complex in 2002, 2003, and 2004, and 2005. It was a bad regime. It still is a bad regime. And uh, I think it can, you can only become confused about that if you have somewhat of a notion that uh, Muslim leaders are morally and ethically superior to others, and, and that uh, gets you into a wrong perception of your immediate neighborhood. All right. Well, let's open the floor uh, discussion to the floor. So, um, well, we, we will have a second session specifically about Middle East. So if you keep your questions for that session about Middle East, all right? So, this is more of a general uh, Turkish foreign policy session. So please introduce yourself and use the microphone that our assistants have for recording purposes. Okay, well, there is one gentleman there. <coughs> and, and if you would like to address a question to a specific person, please go ahead and do so. policy is primarily um, the work of foreign minister Davutoglu, and the reason that, um, perhaps one reason, that um, foreign policy has become somewhat strained is because of the increasing centralization of power in the hands of the prime minister. Do you see the, um, do you think that for foreign policy to change, that power will have to be broken somehow or, or grabbed back, and do you see any realistic chance of that happening? Um, yes, well, uh, it, it, is, it is the sense that I have when, when I observe it, uh, because uh, when, when you look at the statements or so, and, and some of the uh, changes in the, in, in the principles that, that he used to advocate, and, and, and you see that there are uh, more than one people basically doing, doing foreign policy or try to do. So, uh, I am not, I mean, I don't envision some sort of a 
change because the people change or, you know, uh, uh, you know, no, I think nobody knows what will happen next year in Turkey. So uh, we, we hope the best. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, potential, in terms of fixed asset, potential assets or what have you, yes, they are still there, okay? And it could be used again and again. Uh, as long as Turkish foreign policy is is not used over and over for domestic gains, so I think I think that's the key. Whoever is doing it is basically not doing a favor to Turkey. That's that's all I'm saying. Okay. Questions? Yes. Here we have. Do we have a problem with Mike again? Okay. Okay. It's not a lucky day for today. It's just. It's okay. Um, is it on? There is an on button. Okay, go ahead. You know what? Okay, yeah. I can yeah. I can speak really loud. All right. um, okay. My name is Audrey Williams. I'm a Scoble Peace Fellow at the Stimson Center, <coughs> and um, my question is for everyone. Though uh, Professor Da, you uh, answered it a little bit in yours. So, but you talked about um, how you think that the foreign policy is going to stay the same, uh, especially in the next few years. And I was wondering if um, Mr. Wirtz and Mr. Billigan, you. Uh, agreed with that or if you had ideas about where Turkish foreign policy is going to go in the next few years, if there's going to be a recap of the zero problems with neighbors, if they're going to stay the course or if there might be something new or some nuances. Thank you. I, I go last. Okay. Huh? You go last. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> the intelligent man always goes last. Um, I, I don't know, and it's it's not for us to to have a strong opinion about that because the the, the Turks have to figure this out themselves. I would just uh, echo the notion that it's uh, undesirable that foreign policy bleeds into domestic uh, policy affairs and vice versa. Uh, however, having said that, I uh, thinking this from a Turkish national interest perspective would say that the current situation is not sustainable because Turkish leverage in the region is decreased. Uh, it is. It will affect Turkish uh, economic outreach in the long term, which has been a driving factor of foreign policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia and Africa. And it is clear that the uh, Turkish-American relationship, which is still at the core of uh, uh, Turkey's foreign policy strength and Turkish uh, NATO membership, uh, need to be reinvigorated. Uh, uh, imagine how Iraq and Iran uh, might look at Turkey were Turkey not a member of NATO. I think that is sometimes underestimated in public policy debates in, in Turkey, and I would also expect uh, political leaders in the future to make this argument uh, more forcefully. A again, you, you, you can have it both ways. Uh, it is easy to criticize the United States of double standards in its foreign policy, and it's sometimes legitimate, and we have that discussion here just domestically. But double standards are part and parcel of foreign policy. Uh, if you're good and honest, you're transparent about it and explain why. Um, but just to pretend that you can be on both sides of the aisle on virtually every issue in every part of the region is not producing results. I'm not making, again, this is not a moral judgment here. I would say from a Turkish interest perspective, it has not produced results over the past 10 years because if you look in which countries in the immediate region Turkey has leveraged now and where the Turkish word is being heard and where the Turkish foreign minister is called upon to be at the table when it comes to important decision-making processes, the number of these occasions has dwindled. Uh, just uh, one point that I would like to add. Um, I think uh, the central question for Turkish foreign policy at the moment is the Syrian question. Syria is very pressing for Turkey. It produced uh, incredible uh, multi-faced problems in Turkish politics, in Turkey's social fabric, uh, in security of Turkey, uh, let alone this uh, image of Turkey as not capable of projecting its power in the Middle East. Leave that aside. The Syrian question really presents an incredible economic burden, security, security challenges, uh, ethnic challenges within Turkey. Uh, so the priority is going to be I think how to handle the Syrian Syrian uh, question. So on that matter, I think Turkey is prepared to work to the end with its Western allies, particularly the United States, NATO, and look to those allies, uh, sometimes heavily criticized uh, by our for, uh, prime minister. But 
they, they really look to those allies in the West to work together to settle the Syrian question, if not uh, manage to send Assad, but stabilize the region. Uh, so that is going to be the central issue. But while doing this, while searching for uh, a, uh, for a common ground to work together with its Western allies, Turkish officials at the top prime ministers continuing continuing to challenge international order, the UN order. Uh, so when when he speaks uh, about the need to change global order, global normative order. I mean, he sounds like a revisionist leader in the region. Uh, so it is really difficult, yeah. as you say, to combine. On the one hand, you know, speak out this revisionist language, challenging international order, inter international institutions, on the one hand, and then looking to them to help you to resolve the Syrian, Syrian question. That is a big dilemma, I think, for Turkey. and. Uh, the obvious outcome, I mean, the obvious way to resolve this dilemma, uh, I mean, the, the, it's obvious. I mean, you can really get out of this dilemma by focusing on uh, the ways to resolve and address and resolve the Syrian question. But the government doesn't do that because it, uh, it always keep in mind to generate and mobilize support in uh, in Turkey, uh, in the domestic uh, political context, because Turkey is approaching to uh, very important elections in the coming years. So the elections are important in everywhere in the world, especially uh, uh, in Turkey, because next year Turkey is going to elect its first uh, popularly elected president and prime minister seems to be the only candidate from his party. So. This, this heat, I think, is going to continue and uh, challenging uh, uh, discursive uh, statements, I think, will come out from uh, the government, sp government spokespersons because of this uh, domestic pressure. Okay, next question. Can you follow up? Can I follow up with, go ahead. Go with the question? Yes. So um, you made the case that Syria is important, <clears throat> maybe the most important issue yes. for, for Turkey, and I agree with you. So my question to you is uh, the prime minister and the government seem to have dug themselves into a very, very deep hole with regard to Syria. There's very little flexibility on their position, it seems. On the other hand, looking at the current process, the reluctance of the United States government and the U.S. population to get involved in any way, shape, or form, not even to talk about the Europeans, there's a high probability that we'll have a very, very instable Syria with a nominal Assad government. So what is your suggestion for Turkey within the next half year or year to deal with this? I understand that you say there are domestic issues that might make a very inflammatory position um, a political winner, at least in the short term. But doesn't that mean that you are running a tremendous risk uh, with regard to the national security of Turkey just for domestic reasons? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is a really tough question. And I very, uh, I feel very uh, lucky that I'm not in a position to decide. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is now too late, I think. I mean, we have uh, around 500,000 refugees in Turkey. Uh, Syrian refugees, and they, they, they spread out all over Turkey, and they present significant democratic, economic, and security-related problems for Turkey. Turkish borders have become, uh, uh, they, they, don't, they don't really work, they don't bomb. I mean, uh, fighting uh, factions move in and uh, go, go in and go, uh, go back to Syria. So this is a huge problem. I think the only way, one of the ways that Turkey can address this is to keep the Kurdish peace and engage with the Kurdish elements at least in, the, in, the, in, in, in Syria and also in Turkey. That is the only maybe stabilizing leverage that Turkey can have a control over. Uh, apart from this, Turkey has to deal with you know, radical, militant, Al-Qaeda kind of 
organizations active in, in, in Syria. How can Turkey deal with this? I don't know. I think Turkey itself become uh, open to activities of those terrorist organizations. Uh, and I'm very worried uh, about this. Uh, to, to, to reduce the risk of terrorism targeting Turkey, uh, Turkey, I think, should uh, look for some ways of establishing dialogue with Assad in order to reduce especially the risk of uh, terrorist activities uh, coming from Hezbollah-like or uh, Hezbollah-like Hezbollah organizations. Because as Turkey pushed uh, for uh, a strong policy against Assad regime, is Turkey, I mean, Turkey is the target of both Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah at the moment. And they have not really started yet in terms of uh, exporting their terrorist activities into Turkey. So it's a very difficult position. I think Turkey has to consider the fact that they made mistake about the longevity of the Syrian Assad regime. They, they all made mistakes. I think I think United States was also expecting a, a speedy fall of uh, Assad regime, not only Turkey. Uh, they, we also expected uh, that to happen within months, but now things got really stuck in, in Syria. Uh, and the way out, I don't know. I think everyone, uh, many people in the West would be happy to see the current situation to be stabilized, including Assad uh, ruling a normal uh, Syrian state. All right, uh, one last question. Yeah. Actually, I just wanted to follow up the, the Last question to Michael, if I may. Uh, you asked if, if you know what's going to happen in Syria regarding Turkey. My question is to you about the U.S. What the U.S. is going to do uh, if people know Syria uh, saying that uh, refugee crisis is going to be double? There will be maybe four or five million people. Winter is coming. Uh, U.S. is going to watch. Jordan and Lebanon collapsing, what is going to do? I mean, Ilan, you know the, the domestic situation uh, as, as well as I do, if not, if not better. Uh, there is uh, no appetite, neither in the administration nor in the broader population in the United States, to, to get involved. Uh, and uh, the, the way the president uh, played the, uh, uh, his, uh, his decision to, uh, to, uh, to engage in military action against Syria, asking Congress for uh, support, uh, shows you the tremendous domestic uh, challenges here. So I think it is very unlikely uh, that the United States will get involved in any way, shape, or form. But I don't think that the United States will stand by uh, sh uh, just looking at Jordan and Lebanon running into deeper and deeper problems. Uh, I think uh, what is important is to step up um, all uh, peripheral measures from humanitarian aid, diplomatic uh, initiatives, uh, uh, much more massive uh, f financial uh, assets that need to need to be invested. Uh, anything short of uh, of a military uh, intervention, I think, needs to be done to stabilize that entire region. That's in Turkey's interest. That's in Israel's interest. That's in the U.S. interest, and it's in the interest of the. Uh, of the people in Syria. Uh, I have no idea what to do about the internally displaced, displaced people, but as you say, there is uh, over two million outside um, outside Syria. Uh, Turkey is doing a, a fairly good job, although I hope that in the long run, Turkey would also allow international NGOs to help in the efforts. But of course, Jordan and, and, and Lebanon are the main, the main focus points of these initiatives. That's a question uh, for the international community. And I think we've been too slow in acting, uh, the United States and uh, other countries. Uh, money has not been uh, going in quickly enough. Um, the UNHCR, UNDP, all those institutions are overwhelmed. It is a very difficult situation. And uh, I think it is unimaginable to uh, think about the Levant uh, with even greater destabilization. Uh, this is just, it is unsustainable as it is. So I think containment is just the first order of the day as un sufficient that my seem and as morally uh, uh, inadequate this uh, this might be in, in all of our judgment all right well let's conclude our uh, discussion here and reconvene in 10 minutes for the next session thank you yeah. 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 Yeah.